Hey yo! From the kingdom of Ohio, this is O Culture, where we transmit conversations on esoteric art, science, and history at 528 Hertz. I'm your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Big news up front. Check out oculturepodcast.com slash support. We are open for business. More on that after the conversation with our guests because we have one hell of an episode here. Dan Willis is in the house. Dan is one of the Disclosure Project's top secret military witnesses who testified at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. in 2001 in front of every major media outlet. This National Press Club event was a world disclosure event that was asking for a congressional hearing in order to bring forth witnesses and scientists from within government black projects in an effort to release technologies derived from extraterrestrial reverse engineering that have been hidden for nearly 70 years, technologies that could stop further damage to our planet. But instead, the message delivered by those who testified that day was sanitized by a controlled mainstream media. Dan's first-hand experiences as well as his research into the historical indicators that have been purposely omitted from our education system reveal an infiltration of unwarranted influences operating behind the secrecy established for the U.S. national security system, a system that is used to indoctrinate the public, control their opinions, and form their perceptions of an agreed-upon reality, all done in order to hide illegal operations and cover up the true nature of our reality. Dan is a veteran of the U.S. Navy, an ex-radio broadcast engineer, and a former ABC newsman who has taken a keen interest in how the mainstream media has withheld information from the public. Not only has Dan been involved in the Disclosure Project, but his personal and professional interests also led him to the work of Dr. Marcel Vogel, a former research scientist at IBM, who Dan became a research associate of. Dr. Vogel did pioneering work in human and plant communication experiments, which then led him to the study of quartz crystals and the creation of faceted crystals for therapeutic use. Dr. Vogel's research into the therapeutic application of quartz crystals also led him to the investigation of the relationship between crystals and water, where he discovered that he could structure water by spinning it around a tuned crystal, altering many of the characteristics of the water and converting it into an information storage system. As I said, this is one hell of an episode. We get into all of this and a whole lot more, if you can believe it. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Dan Willis. Enjoy. Dan Willis, welcome to the show. I appreciate you taking the time here. My pleasure. Uh, Anything to dig into the subject matter and expose what the truth is about it. Yeah, and we have quite a lot to talk about. But first, I'd like to start with you and your background for the benefit of the listeners who may not know who you are. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I, you know, my involvement with this uh, is, goes back to, um, back in 1969 when I was in the U.S. Navy working at the uh, busiest military communication facility on the planet, Naval Communication Station, San Francisco. I was a high-speed uh, code operator with a Top secret crypto level 14 extra sensitive material handling security clearance. I was in charge of the code room, which is a ship to shore communications, which they use primitive <laughs> method of code, you know, to get messages, you know, in the teletype because of uh, atmospheric conditions. Anyway, out of thousands of, you know, secret, top secret messages, there was one that all stuck in my head as I was decoding the message that came from a ship off the coast of Alaska, you know, a Navy ship that the crew witness coming off of port bow about a 70 foot in diameter brightly glowing uh elliptical object uh glowing reddish orange it merged out of the ocean and shot straight up in the space the radar operator on the ship tracked the blips going estimated 7,000 miles per hour at the time you know <laughs> my only experience was you know science fiction movies and uh, that sort of thing and i didn't you know, I couldn't imagine what it could be, what kind of technology on this earth could be. So, you know, through the decades, I've had some personal encounters with uh, craft going like 100 feet over my head and also conscious contact with a craft. And uh, it wasn't until um, year 2000 that 
you know, a girlfriend of mine wanted to go to uh, this conference about Dr. Greer was going to go to Washington to uh, get all these witnesses, you know, to he's collected over 450 witnesses due to the CIA director during the Clinton administration being denied access. They realized that uh, our legal constitutional government was being denied into the subject matter and that uh, so the only way to do it is to gather, you know, admirals, generals, astronauts, uh, and, you know, in the intelligence and military community and go before the public, the National Press Club, and do a world disclosure event. You know, you had his life threatened to do that. I was uh, not really scheduled to be there, but one of the witnesses kind of chickened out. And so I basically volunteered and uh, there was like 22 cameras in the back row, all the major media, you know, CNN, CBS, you know, all of them. Each one of us, uh, there was 21 of the 450 witnesses that were willing to testify. Each one of us gave a testimony and stated afterward that we were willing to testify under oath before Congress, which is, you know, penalty of perjury, people breaking national security oaths and stuff like that. But these, the fact that these operations are unconstitutionally illegal, and uh, so there's really no repercussions to the witnesses doing so. But um, what, uh, you know, the mainstream media, I took a keen interest that, you know, how do you get 22 cameras in the back row and disclose that, uh Presidents, CIA directors are being denied access. We had a solution to get off of nuclear oil and coal for over 60 years with technology. We already had faster than light flying disks back in the early 50s. There were bases discovered on the other side of the moon. 57 different species of extraterrestrials have already been categorized by 1989. Future false flag plans were in the works, uh, next being terrorists, of which four months later, after the May 9th, 2001 press club, you know, the 9-11 event occurred. Of course, the mainstream media sanitized that because any piece of that information would have alerted, you know, the public. And so they made it sound like 450 military intelligence witnesses wanting to have a congressional hearing for the reality of UFOs, which that is what you would call the the um, CIA uses a term called limited hangout, which means that they hang out just a piece of the information that's true, but the explosive real stuff, they, they hold back. So they sort of got off the hook by saying, oh, yeah, well, we covered that event, but they leave out all the critical, crucial bits of information. So, you know, CBS uh, came down and after, you know, I was on CNN and CBS came and did a special interview with me. And I said to them, look, I'm not going willing to do this interview unless you can allow me to say this little five second <laughs> clip that says we have the scientists within the black projects that can prove before an open congressional hearing that we have a solution for the energy and environmental crisis on the planet, uh, non polluting you know, technology. They promised up and down. Uh, the producer, she was kind of in tears. I said, she said, uh, I said, but you promised, you know. And she said, well, I'm sorry. The higher executives, you know, read CIA, made me cut that part out, you know. And I didn't really understand the structure of the infiltration of the CIA and the history of it and how it got into ever since – Operation Mockingbird controlling the, the media. It wasn't until 2014 that a uh, company out of media, I mean, a media company out of Hollywood asked me to write an article on media control being a witness and an ex-ABC newsman. And so, you know, as I started to research, I had to put together a chronology of trying to understand how our mainstream media has become so infiltrated and is withholding information that could stop the energy and the environmental crisis on this planet, and who is behind it, and what's the agenda. And so, you know, I'm, I'm continually learning. You know, I study the subject, look at all the new witnesses that are coming out. And we have way over 500 witnesses. I mean, you know, how many do you need? <laughs> you know, if you go to, you have, you have five witnesses in a court of law, each willing to testify under oath, uh, you'd have a closed case. We have over 500, but that's not the issue. The issue is that 
there is a control mechanism in place that's keeping this from being disclosed to the people of the world. You know, that's a little bit about me. <laughs> you mentioned that you were an ex-ABC newsman. Was that just for like a local affiliate or what? Yeah, just a local affiliate. I was, uh, I happen to, I have a pretty good technical background. So I was a chief engineer for the um, uh, broadcast engineer from the most powerful FM station on the West Coast. And I was not like a big TV anchor man or anything like that. I just read the news reports, uh, you know, on the radio for, you know, I'd rip off from the teletypes, UPI and AP and read the, uh, I didn't have any idea that at the highest level, all this information is being carefully um, engineered uh, in order to gain the public's consent at the time. Yeah, so even at the local level, is there any indication of that, or you're just reading news without questioning it? Exactly. You're, just, you're getting little blips of news, and the way it's worded and the way it's presented, you don't know any better. The, the people who are on television that are reading the news to you, they're reading a teleprompter. They don't know who crafted that information at the highest level. Um, we know that, you know, back in 1950, Operation Mockingbird, they had like 400 journalists that the CIA was providing the information to the news network. And, you know, recently, uh, last year or so, we've had some journalists that are been in the business for like 25 years and that they are what's called non-official covers where they are given information from the CIA to look as though it's coming out from an independent source. But if they're ever discovered, you know, the, the CIA disavows. Anyway, we have people coming out and testifying. Unfortunately, the one man that did, he recently died. So, yeah, we have a situation where the information is carefully um, crafted and engineered. But a lot, of people are, a lot of people are aware of that. They watch the evening news. But then again, there's a lot of people that are in more of a trusting attitude where they, you know, you, you don't want to believe that, you know, a lot of important information is being withheld from you as you watch the news and it's being crafted in order to gain your consent toward an agenda. Right. You know, going back to your time in the Navy, were you aware of any black projects back then? No. Um, uh, I worked uh, in a highly secured facility. You had uh, electronic colored badges at us and, I had a pretty high level, so I was able to work with crypto and burning, you know, top secret documents and stuff like that. But I had no idea back then. You, so wait, you were burning top secret documents? What? I mean, did you did you read any of them, or were you just putting them in a dumpster and lighting them on fire? Oh no, I write. I have to take the messages, so I have to read all of them. You know. Okay. But no, we have to. You have to destroy the documents. Uh, there's a giant burning room where they taken you know you got to get rid of this stuff you know <laughs> you can't yeah. let it out outside but uh, a lot of it's you know just uh admirals cussing at each other for messing things up i was in combat action in vietnam as well taking communications and you know so you know i had no idea <laughs> i had no idea it just i couldn't imagine this message that was classified as secret priority level was going to the chief of naval operations in washington I knew it was definitely something significant and important to them to classify it that way. So you don't go sending messages to the chief of naval operations unless it's something of their interest. Right. So as one of the Disclosure Project's top military witnesses, when you testified at the National Press Club back in 2001, are you able to share what you said at that press conference then? Well, sure. Basically, well, I just pretty much shared with you. But, you know, in addition, you know, I worked for 13 years at the uh, Naval Electronics Engineering Center in San Diego, working on military satellite, you know, secure communications and, and all kinds of different electronic projects. Um, one of my coworkers worked at the NORAD facility. And when he first started working at the facility, he noticed that objects going, you know, just off the scale, you know, really thousands of miles per hour, you know, going, stopping, making right-hand turns. He inquired for his older supervisor, and he said, oh, just a visit from one of our little friends. thought it was kind of unusual. But that's pretty much my 
I tried to keep it short because we had 21 witnesses. Each one had to give their testimony. And so uh, my testimony was pretty, I think, uh, I wouldn't say I was one of the top witnesses. I was one of the top secret security clearance, you know, witnesses. But I was definitely probably on the low on the totem pole uh, regarding the other witnesses had far more significant, uh, although everything collaborates with each other, but some of the other witnesses, you know, nuclear launch officers, you know, captains in the Air Force uh, having their nukes being shut down with a, a beam coming in and shutting down all their, like, 10 ICBMs. And, and most of them had supporting official documentation, you know, from, you know, Office of Special Investigations in the Air Force and the Department of the Navy, like Commander Bethune, where he had a, he had a full report and a craft came up right in front of his uh, aircraft. I contacted the Office of Naval Intelligence to see if I can get a copy of the report, but unfortunately, the um, the logs are destroyed after a certain period of time. So I wasn't able, unlike the other witnesses, you know, bring collaborating you know documentation. Well, we need to get into the nature of extraterrestrials themselves, then, because this is something that pretty divisive. I mean, whether they're real or not, and then the people that believe that they're real, I think you mentioned this earlier, there's a bunch of infighting among that group as to, you know, well, which types are there and where do they come from? So in your experience, can you say definitively one way or the other, does intelligent life off of Earth exist? Definitely, yes, uh, it does exist. And we have, you know, secret space programs, we have top secret craft that is flying out there you know most of it is uh most of it is you know a lot of it's ours you know and some of it is theirs so as far as my own personal experience all i can say is i was driving with my brother at night in arizona going up this mountain road and we were driving for several hours and i'd pull over to the side to take a break uh, he got out and was stretching and before i knew it my door flew open. He yanked me out into the road. He says, look, 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 look. He's pointing up. He must have seen it when it was coming. We were kind of high up on this mountain uh, at night. And it was about 100 feet above us, about maybe about 50 feet in diameter, white with a, it was circular uh, with a greenish glow to it. And it flew right over our heads and then shot across the desert and made a wrangled turn. That was probably the closest. And then I had a, I had a um, had an experience that was more along the line of a conscious connection, where I was camping up in the mountains outside of San Diego in the Laguna Mountains, and with a girlfriend, and we uh, kind of went off the beaten path. And I was out gathering some firewood, and this um, intelligence, like. I, all I could describe is like it came out of the sky, you know, and it was like beautiful. It was up in the mountains. You could see all the stars. And it felt like, um, I don't know how to describe it, but it felt like clear, total, coherent thought and grabbing my attention. And it was like coming from the sky. And so it was so intense, I actually raised my hand out to the sky and I said, is somebody out there you know like that a star or well, i thought it was a star you know started coming into scintillating colors and started bobbing up and down like yes i called the girlfriend over and i said are you seeing what i'm seeing and she got kind of worried that they were going to come in closer which i was kind of hoping <laughs> but uh that was kind of an interesting experience and I, I've been on a number of Dr. Greer's CSETI expeditions, uh, you know, the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence, mm -hmm. where he uses these uh, CE5 protocols. Essentially, uh, you know, anybody can do this. It's just a matter of, of uh, kind of getting into a center within yourself and kind of like remote viewing and, you know, putting a call out there. And they've, you know, vectored in craft and situations. And I've Although I've had more profound experiences just on my own, those uh, protocols do work because they do respond to conscious thought. Well, the, yeah, that's what I'm wondering is if we're creating or manifesting these these entities that we call extraterrestrials. That was kind of what I was trying to get at was, are these legitimate physical beings that live on other planets or are these creations of our mind? 
Well, there's too much evidence that indicates that these are living biological beings that are like us, but different. And some have evolved, you know, thousands, maybe millions of years in advance of us. So it would, it seems like, you know, magic, you know, to us. Yeah, their, their, their technology is so far in advance. That, and it all enter, when you get up to that level of evolution, it becomes more involved with consciousness. Is there a chance then that it's a little bit of both? Well, you know, there was a top secret authenticated document that came out in the 50s by uh, Wilbur Smith. And, you know, they said, yeah, one, flying saucers are real. You know, there's a group headed by Vannevar Bush that's studying this group. It's, it's uh, you know, rated higher than the hydrogen bomb, you know, for classification of secrecy. And one of the things that they stated is there is, has to do with psychological phenomena. You know, so not so much that, you know, people are just hallucinating and seeing flying saucers, you know, like, um, you know, thousands, you know, thousands and thousands of people are, are seeing these things, but that they can alter reality. They can alter perceptions. Wait, who is they? Who's us, uh, them? Who is that? Well, the advanced beings, they they have an ability to change, uh, they, they, you know, they've been able to, you know, pull people through walls, they can, they can manipulate matter, you know, as, you know, leading edges of science are finding out that the nature of reality that we live in is indeed holographic, and that it's essentially the particles that we were told, you know, back in the 50s, 60s, and, you know, high school and whatever, well, I'm born back ways is oscillating it's it's oscillating and it has geometric aspects to it and that it uh there's huge amounts of space in between the this, these oscillations that is forming what seems to be this solid 3d reality that we're experiencing and it is affected by consciousness and so an advanced race that could um manipulate someone's perception through that ability hmm. yeah i've heard that before and that makes me want to go back to you outline gosh you outline quite a bit on your website the webmatrix.net let's go back and kind of cover some of the history of extraterrestrial contact with humanity how far back does this actually go you think well it goes back thousands and thousands of years probably before we even existed as a race but in what I just went back on the on the website that you mentioned, uh, you know, the webmatrix.net, uh, is basically just my I'm freely sharing my online notes with everybody. It started out to be an article, like I said, but as I started to dig into, I keep finding more and more pieces of the puzzle and plugging it into the chronology as as it becomes validated from different uh, different sources. Probably around 1919 is when uh, Maria Orsic was starting to get uh, ancient Sumerian channeling, you know, when these, from this Germanic uh, occult society of the, uh, the Viral and the Thule Society. Her father gave her channeling, you know, once it was decoded to Dr. Schumann at the University of Munich, and they found there was viable physics in it. And so they started designing, working with, creating these craft, and they were able to, uh, around the early 30s, able to create a, uh, a craft that could warp time around it and could fly. Tesla was even involved with this and, and in communication with uh, Maria Orsic, who also knew how to create an anti-gravity vehicle, you know, and publicly stated so. He taught his protege, Otis T. Carr, how to create this craft. Otis was able to produce that back in the 50s and actually has a patent. And what happened was, as soon as he was able to get it going, what happened is the FBI came in and confiscated everything. There was indications that the reason why this happened is during the end of World War II, there was a massive infiltration of Nazis into the United States. There was a plan that they had Oh, and winding back the clock before the end of World War II, the Nazis apparently had entered into an agreement with a race that they discovered down in Antarctica, 
that was a reptilian race that was able to give them technology and an exchange program. What happened was at the end of World War II, the Nazis had a fallback plan, and they called it Falkenschallenskrieg, which translates to worldview warfare. Their plan was, you know, they couldn't beat the industrial might of the United States, which could make, you know, 10 battleships or 10 bombers to every one that they could create. They couldn't, they couldn't compete with our industrial might. So the Nazis wanted to work qualitatively rather than quantitatively. In other words, work smart rather than hard. They uh, had a lot of assets within the United States. Uh, one major asset was Alan Dulles, who set up an arrangement with uh, General Reinhard Gellin to bring 3,000 Nazi spies into the was OSS at the time, into the CIA. What they deploy was to... Truman was very afraid of the Soviets, and the Nazis had Soviet intelligence reports, which they hid in um, microfiches in these sealed containers throughout the Bavarian mountains, and so they used it as a trading chip to bring all these Nazi spies into the United States. Actually, a lot of them stayed over there, but they were all on the CIA payroll. What they did was they gave Truman false estimates of the Soviet and so what this did was, see, Truman wanted to get rid of the CIA. It was created back in 1947, you know, right after the Roswell incident, which, you know, they gave a cover story and hauled it off to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Actually, there's more, there's, there was more crashes before then, back in the Battle of L.A. back in 1942, which started studying all of this. But anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. What happened was on the infiltration, as everybody's aware of, you know, Project Paperclip, and they brought in a lot of Nazi scientists, but hundreds of thousands of the SS and everything, new papers were written, they were um, released. What happened was they infiltrated into the corporations, they infiltrated into NASA, you know, even... Uh, one of the uh, astronauts, uh, McKellen, who was working with Dr. Uh, DeBus in NASA, who was an ex-Nazi scientist, actually saw Hans Kammler, who was in charge of uh, Himmler's uh, secret projects, you know, the Dyglock, the Bell, you've heard of that, was actually alive and well and, you know, interacting with NASA. So, you know, they uh, infiltrated into the pharmaceutical industries, starting with Scripps Institute. They... Um, Basically, uh, with Alan Dulles, was probably the most instrumental. It was the uh, start of MK Ultra program. He, um, 1950, the you know, as I said, Operation Mockingbird. The CIA's control of the mainstream media, which happens to today. 1951, they started Project Dove, which was the entertainment industry. Well, they started giving scripts to the uh, movie industry to seed the population with these ideas and concepts. Uh, the first movie they produced was The Day the Earth Stood Still, which was basically kind of a positive message that, you know, so that if we don't you know, stop our violence, that our earth will be reduced to a burned-out cinder, you know, type of thing. And then, uh, you know, much later you find that uh, Admiral Leslie Stevens was working with uh, Admiral Rick Obodo, who was James Forrestal, assigned him to um, working with these 29 embedded U.S. Navy spies that were in, in Nazi Germany. They were trying to catch up. See, the Nazis had developed anti-gravity or developing craft back in the 30s. And the United States was like two decades behind. And so, uh, you know, back in the back in the mid-40s, they were um, getting information from these spies and disseminating it to major corporations, you know, like um, Douglas Aircraft Company and, you know, uh, TRW, Lockheed, Boeing, you know, all the all the big corporations involved with that, to try to catch up uh, with what they were doing. And they also, uh, at the end of World War II, they, so that people don't really know what really happened, that uh, most of all the Nazis escaped. Hitler escaped. Uh, Heinrich Himmler escaped. You know, and they had their doppelgangers, you know, <laughs> fill in for them. And what happened, uh, the Rockefellers, which were on board with the fascist agenda, they uh, took over control of the United States back in 1946, right, a year after the end of the war. And 
they rewrote the history of what actually happened at the end of World War II. You know, there's a lot of, it's kind of what you could call the limited hangout there as well, where there's a lot of true things that happened at the end of World War II. My father was in, in World War II, uh, protecting Iceland against the Nazis and, and the Korean War. What happened was, um, for generation, they knew that generation after generation, we would become falsely indoctrinated. And so they withheld all this advanced technology. And, and it wasn't until like 1955 that, well, actually, you know, just before 1955, there was a meeting at Edwards Air Force Base, which was Murdoch Air Force Base back then, with uh, Nordic extraterrestrials that offered to help us with our spiritual development. But they wanted us to relinquish our nuclear weapons, and the generals wanted to have more technology for military superiority but the nordics wouldn't go along with that so it wasn't until like february of 1955 that on uh Holloman air force base that uh extraterrestrials these tall grays or tall whites whatever you want to call them that are aligned with the straco federation with the nazis cut a deal with the u.s military industrial complex basically cut a deal with them in exchange for abducting humans and allowing them to, uh, of course, they'd get technology in exchange, but they'd also allow the extraterrestrials to use certain bases, you know, such as Area 51 S4 for their operations and things. So what happened was kind of a split between the Navy and the Air Force in that accord and that, well, you know, when Eisenhower left office, he tried to warn everybody. He's, he tried to say that, you know, you have to be an alert and knowledgeable citizenry in order to protect our future liberties and freedoms and that to take nothing for granted that there is a potential for the disastrous rise within the military industrial complex due to these unwarranted influences. You know, he tried to warn everybody. He shared all that information with Kennedy, who was well aware his Kennedy's background was in office naval intelligence and saw the reports that back in uh, 1942, when two of the craft were shot down, one went to um, one went to the Army Air Force. 1947 is when the Army Air Force turned into the U.S. Air Force, and they took it to their facilities, and the Navy took the other one and took it to their facilities. But what happened was there was a split occurred where the, um, the the Project RAND is where this whole thing started. They were studying this whole and and the relationship to, uh, you know, the psychological operations are going on in the media. And what happened was the uh, Air Force felt like it should dominate since it's things in the air right so you know things ufos must be the air force not the navy navy just floats out there in the water right so they had huge amounts of money come in so basically the air force took over the rand corporation the rand project rand turned into the rand corporation in 1948 and so they continued working along those lines and the navy secretly developed its own program out in um working with the uh, spies and things were the Naval Air Station in San Diego, where my father worked for 20 years. And uh, China Lake is where they were developing these things and actually building them in the Wasash Mountains in Utah. So all this was going on highly compartmentalized, where one person doesn't know what the other person's doing. So the Navy is kind of like doing its own thing, and the Air Force and Army and the Industrial Military Complex is doing its other thing with this other group of extraterrestrials. So what happened was Kennedy, aware of the infiltration of basically the Nazis... Uh, through Alan Dulles, and uh, that's why he fired Alan Dulles for his nefarious activities he was doing. And he tried to warn the public that there is a uh, monolithic global conspiracy that uses infiltration and that to uh, beware of the dangers of secrecy and of secret societies. This kind of echoes the first CIA director that was also the head of the MJ-12 commission that Truman set up, Admiral Roscoe Hillencotter. He warned about the dangers of secrecy surrounding the UFO issue and urged open congressional hearing on the matter. Forrestal, who was one of those members of the original MJ-12, he wanted to have disclosure to the public. But, you know, after uh, Admiral Byrd, you know, on Operation High Jump was defeated after trying to attack the Nazi base down in Antarctica, 
what happened was he wanted to come out with a disclosure. You know, um, Truman put him into the hospital at, uh, in Maryland where he was uh, suicided out the 17th window of the uh, hospital because the other members were vehemently opposed to the Air Force guys to disclosing this. So it wasn't until when Kennedy started to try to unravel the CIA and MJ-12, what happened was, I'm getting ahead of myself again, how this whole thing happened, a split between our legal constitutional government, the reason why the disclosure project started with uh, James Woolsey, the CIA director, which Dr. Greer met back in 93, that started the disclosure project, of which I'm one of those witnesses, was because of Eisenhower's need to have plausible deniability. He was well aware of what was going on. And so he had Nelson Rockefeller restructure the MJ-12 CIA operations, which put him out of the loop. And so he no longer had constitutional jurisdiction or oversight over these operations. And so immediately when that happened, several things just came into play. One, the original MJ-12 group was replaced with a secret executive order that put Alan Dulles as the head, MJ-1, of the new MJ-12 group. All operations, so they would no longer be under public scrutiny, moved from uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base over to Area 51 and over into S-4 where they, they kept about nine craft uh Five were extraterrestrial, two were uh, of the German Nazi group, and uh, two were of the, the Viral Society, the uh, original ones that, back in 1919. And so Kennedy was attempting to, for one, he, he was trying to get information on MJ-12 activities, of which Alan Dulles was now in charge, and he's also the head of the CIA longest sitting CIA director. He tried to get us out of the Vietnam War so I wouldn't have to go there in you know, 1969 or whatever. He tried to get us off the Federal Reserve, which got us involved back in 1913 with international bankers, this whole thing. Uh, he tried to uh, get NASA to cooperate with the Soviet Union on the, quote, outer space matters. And uh, what happened was Alan Dulles wrote an assassination directive Basically saying that, you know, Lancer was a code word for JFK, is looking into our activities, and this we must not allow. In other words, they needed to have something in order to promote the continuance of the group, because if Kennedy was going to, he wanted to splinter the CIA into a thousand pieces. And so this last inquiry that he did was 10 days before his assassination, when James Jesus Angleton, who was the protege of of uh, Alan Dulles, they were destroying one of the counterintelligence agents, we were trying to destroy all the stuff, pulled one of these documents out, which was called the Burn Memo, which outlined this and was an assassination directive called Project Environment, which basically cryptically said that, you know, when we can't get any more progress with Washington, that it should be the environment should be wet, which is a uh, intelligence term for it should be wet with blood. In other words, it should be an assassination. Anyway, that was executed. And uh, then Kennedy was, uh, you know, after warning, ironically, after warning the world about the dangers of secret societies, here you have, he's replaced with uh, LBJ, a 33rd degree Freemason, by the way, in a secret societies. Um, with the Freemasons, there's the um, there's a York and there's the Scottish Rite. And the Scottish Rite, uh, which was infiltrated back in 1776 by the Rothschild Illuminati group, they created a 33rd degree, which is an honorary degree. There's nothing you can do on your own to get to the 33rd degree. You have to be selected. And the uh, secret societies work in kind of like a, kind of like the military in a chain of command pyramidal, where the higher levels give orders to the lower. And when you go through several levels of indoctrinations, you keep secrets really well at the end. And so uh, here we have a 33rd degree Freemason for uh, LBJ, Alan Dulles, a 33rd degree Freemason, Earl Warren Justice, who did the Warren Commission. It was a 33rd degree Freemason. You have uh, Gerald Ford, future president, 33rd degree Freemason, who tried to say the bullet of the lone gunman came in from another direction. 
and all of them concluded that, uh, oh, it was a lone gunman that killed him. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, after that, around 1967, there was a lot of people that were questioning what really happened with the Kennedy assassination. And so there was a uh, document, a CIA secret dispatch that used the term conspiracy theorists to discredit anybody to come up with an alternative theory to the uh, you know proposed uh, story and so they would discredit people anybody who had they would say oh they have financial interests that's why I don't never associate any money with anything I do with any of this stuff you know they all kinds of different reasons saying that you know these people are just coming up with these theories that are not based on anything and so they even use that to present day you know call these people you know conspiracy theorists that there no there's no basis in fact behind them anyway it's been a long uh, matrix of perception you could say that's been created since the end of world war ii and an infiltration that uh, kennedy warned us about did occur and every president ever since kennedy has basically been approved to present day uh but you know who knows about current presidential administration i think it kind of took him by surprise but you know trump's kind of a mixed bag on his own you know it's like uh on his own thing so it's just kind of interesting you know after after the year 2000 all of these witnesses coming out of the secret space programs which we know they had a secret space program but you know you have to watch out there's you know disinformation agents you have to really do the due diligence and there's so much information out you know coming on the alternative media of which uh you know brzezinski was afraid of that because there's because they don't have control like they do over the corporations in the mainstream media the alternative media such as your show ryan is providing an avenue around that and uh, they're afraid that a global awakening is occurring. And, it's, you know, as Snowden leaked, you know, all the, uh, <laughs> all the efforts of perception management, you know, the trolls, shills, sock puppets, and all the leaked documents, you know, that are implying that, uh, you know, they've been desperately trying to manage our perceptions in order to hide this reality. You know, and this reality could change the future of humanity with technologies and across the board you know as ben rich head of lockheed skunk works that's anything you can imagine we already know how to do except take an act of god to release because we know how to travel to the stars he said we know how to take et home but it would take an act of god to get these technologies released out of the black projects to benefit the world so anyway that's where we're at i didn't mean to ramble on so long ryan um uh, no, no. Hey, it was Are you still <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I am. There are a couple of points I want to touch on. The first is I get stuck on the warning that Werner von Braun issued on his deathbed. Are you familiar with that? Oh, yeah, very familiar. Yeah, so uh, I I just just want to recap it real quick, you know, he pretty much warned us that we were going to be, you know, you mentioned false flag events and that's kind of what he was alluding to and and I think the first point he, he mentioned was communism. We saw that with the Red Scare. Then he said terrorism, which, you know, we're currently living through this constant threat of terror, which doesn't really exist, I guess. But, and then that third phase was this extraterrestrial threat, which right. seems there were, to be. There was countries of, of concern. You could, you could, you could definitely see that with North Korea, you know, happening after that. And then they said, you know, concern about asteroids and all this was to, in order to, build this uh build this huge funnel huge amounts of money into this uh industrial complex that would fight this uh this situation well there was a leaked document that substantiated this that lbj hit the roof and suppressed it for all time back in 1967 that was a purport from iron mountain which talked about the need for basically having perpetual enemies and perpetual wars and that uh, they talked about contriving a threat from outer space you know so this was this was in the works for a long time and von braun on his deathbed he released that information this was in 1977 when he died and it seems to be coming right along because you know the soviets was as i mentioned earlier it was a false flag and the fact that they were getting false intelligence reports and it was like what 
uh, six or eight trillion dollars, I forget which, uh, that were put into the Cold War. And all this was funneled into these operations. And then you have the drug operations going on with, you know, Zapata Oil Company with, you know, George Bush Sr. And you've got, uh, when I was in Vietnam, I know a captain from, saw the drugs going in on the planes that were going back and forth. Or they get a lot of money from unaccountable resources, you know. The huge amounts of money. I mean, we know that the entire, like Catherine Austin Fitz, who was one of the witnesses that, you know, it's like the the whole Pentagon budget is like one third of what Black Budget project you know goes into, which is about one. They estimated the back about one point seven trillion dollars. And then you know, just before the nine eleven terrorist event happened, the day before, you know, Rumsfeld talking about, oh, we can't account for two point three trillion dollars. And then of course that got completely ignored the next day. Everything went off the radar once 9-11 hit, you know. There was uh, a lot of, you know, even though it was only for like a, about a, a minute, a minute and a half at the most on CNN, you know, watching cover the events in a very sanitized manner. I seen my testimony, you know, like in five or six different languages all across the, the web. So it got on, on, on the alternative media. And it actually inspired uh, a UK hacker, uh, Gary McKinnon, listening to the testimonies, talking about Mark McCandish, one of the witnesses, you know, where his uh, colleague saw actually a 50s exhibit that was showing these faster than light hovering disks that were like, you know, one was 120 feet in diameter, or one was 50 feet. And these were old technologies back in the 50s, you know. He was hacking into the U.S. Space Command and saw, you know, a list of non-terrestrial officers and not USS, but USSS ships like Hillencotter, you know, which is, you know, the CIA director, MJ, first MJ-12 director, and Lee May, who was high up in the Air Force, uh, involved in this as well. So, and it was not involved in any of the, in other words, there was no U.S. Navy, uh, ships of that name. So there was, and plus you saw, you know, these large cigar-shaped craft and things like that into the database. You know, and the Bush administration wanted to put them away forever, like 70 years in prison or something. Fortunately, that didn't happen to him. But uh, well, he independently, uh, and he was using like a 50, maybe a 20, 24 uh, kilobyte or something like that modem back then. Uh, you know, the hack end of the stuff. And, you know, they were kind of sloppy with passwords, so it wasn't like a big deal to get into it. So he kind of independently uh, verified that, you know, a secret space program is happening behind the scenes. Yeah, no doubt about that. I wanted to circle back to real quick to Alan Dulles, as you mentioned, the longest reigning CIA director. So, you know, the CIA is, is closely tied now to things like mind control and propaganda and social manipulation. And Dulles had a hand in... Where all this started way back when in the 20s, I believe, when the Tavistock Institute started. Could you maybe cover the history of that group? Because I don't know if a lot of people know what that is. Oh, yeah, for sure. This was this was back in, in England where they were studying um, traumatized World War I veterans and seeing how they could work with disassociating personalities and be able to control minds and things like that. But, you know, the NDAA has made all of this legal with using disinformation against the American public that Obama signed and also this anti-propaganda act that he did last Christmas, during Christmas. What happened was... uh, Billions of dollars goes into these think tanks connected with Travistock Institute and Sanford Research Institute. Anyway, there's an Iran Corporation basically engineering consent. These, you're talking about the highest level of people who have an understanding of sociology and psychology and to manipulate the masses. And the CIA is tied into these groups and the highest levels in the, uh, for example, Daniel Sheehan, one of the witnesses that joined us uh, in Washington back in 2001, you know, he testified that, you know, uh, Jimmy Carter tried to get the UFO files, but they didn't apparently trust him. George Bush Sr. denied him access, you know. He had a document 
that listed 42 CIA NSA operatives that were at the highest executive media positions within these corporations that main job is to sanitize this information in case it comes out like like the National Press Club back in 2001. So when you watch television and you're watching the evening news, keep in mind that the highest levels, and you're talking about you know, uh, the New York Times, you're talking about the Washington Post, you're talking about, you know, besides the the media networks, also the newspaper networks. And this, as far back as uh, 1917, actually, that Rockefeller, you know, the one who wrote the history of the Nazi invasion, infiltration, rather, Warburg, the one who was partly responsible for getting us into the Federal Reserve back in 1913, and J.P. Morgan, who was infamous in suppressing, you know, Tesla's inventions. Those three got together and purchased all the main newspapers throughout the United States and put their own editors in place so that they can control what the masses were perceiving. And so uh, today, you know, this is uh, it's still controlled, but it's controlled more by through the Council of Foreign Relations. So, yes, when you're watching the evening news, know that don't watch the news, monitor the news. Because look at it in a way that when they're, when they're showing you something, they'll show you emotional scenes, they'll show you this, and they'll, and they'll come to certain conclusions. Keep in mind that they are engineering your consent they're wanting you to have a particular perception of something in order that fits their agenda which is controlled by the intelligence agencies that have essentially been infiltrated so that's the situation we have today we have a uh, we have a media that is uh you know trump ran up against that <laughs> a number of times you know the, the wikileaks you know released a lot of emails that with with podesta some are rather interesting like uh podesta communicating with his now passed away the late uh edgar mitchell who was one of our witnesses that talks in the email about you know releasing the zero point energy uh which is real and about the vatican's awareness of the eti the extraterrestrial intelligence and that the uh, benevolent ETs are not going to allow a world war. You know, they look at their ability to shut down nukes. You know, Larry Warren was one of the witnesses that uh, joined us back then. He was he was the one that broke the story for the uh, Bentwaters uh, Air Force Base, where they had a you know a craft land outside, and the uh, Air Force guys they. He took a gun butt and he hit him against the head and, and said, you sign these papers that, you know, you won't disclose this information. He's an incredible hero coming out. So that's our situation today. The, um, the media is, is controlled. And regarding the uh, zero-point energy, I, uh, you know, having a, a pretty good technical background with electronics and engineering, I realized after the Bush administration denied to bring the scientists within the black projects that could prove that we have a solution to get off of these dangerous obsolete technologies that use nuclear oil and coal, uh, which the corporations have a lot of vested interest in. Dr. Greer attempted, since we couldn't bring them in out of the black projects, which is really difficult, unless we had a full congressional approval and the public behind it. What we did was to set up a corporation, and we had a database of about 300 scientists and inventors around the planet. And so with my wife, Rebecca, when we got engaged, <laughs> what a honeymoon, huh? We, uh, we, <laughs> yeah. flew to, we flew to Virginia. Yeah, it was kind of funny, the story. Um, I, we're in our Airstream motorhome down in Arizona, and I kind of wake up in the middle of the night, and I said, I think the professor needs our help, you know. And um, Dr. Greer was working with Professor Loiter, who was working with these energy inventors. And so we flew over there, and I flew down to the Dominican Republic to meet with this one inventor that had an energy device that was printing about 500 watts, Dr. Greer said, I don't want to see any batteries connected to this at all. And so what he did was, out in his front yard, he put a couple of rods in that we, we checked. It was less than a watt coming out. Basically made an earth battery, so to speak. So less than one watt was coming out and powering this rotational device 
that was powering uh, about almost 500 watts of loads and had a 300 watt light bulb, a 100 watt light bulb, an oscillating fan, boom blaster was playing Caribbean music. And this thing ran for about an hour and a half, you know. When we flew back down, the situation was two CIA guys showed up at his door before we got there and said, if this works, you're dead. Uh, so he had disassembled the entire thing. Uh, anyway, it's a long, crazy story. Anyway, in Virginia, we set up a, a temporary lab right down the street from Thomas Jefferson's place there in Monticello. And Rebecca and I lived there for months <laughs> with a terrible blow-up inflatable bed and things. Uh, but we had all this lab equipment set up, and we met with different scientists and things. One was this Dutch inventor who was... Uh, Incredible genius. I mean, he wrote several books on the advanced calculus way over my head of the dynamics of electron flow. I mean, the, the books was filled with advanced calculus formulas. Anyway, he was able to prove to me his theories and show that he was able to extract energy out of the environment. Anyway, he had a box about the size of a shoebox putting out about 140 watts. He was going to go to Europe to patent it, but unfortunately he was found dead slumped over the steering wheel in the uh, long-term parking lot in the airport. Another of our team, Eugene Maloff, I was a member of one of six technical advisors. Uh, everybody had multiple PhDs in science and physics except me. Uh, I just have a lot of first-hand knowledge working with things and uh, and alternative <laughs> alternative science working with uh, Dr. Marcel Vogel in the 1980s. So Anyway, we'd meet with these different people and try to uh, try to evaluate things that would work. I've met with uh, I worked with John Bedini for many years. Unfortunately, you know, recently he just died, and his brother died within four hours after him, suspiciously. I met with uh, Professor Tom Bearden, who had a lot of advanced theory and how these things working with the government and these projects, and uh, he had a had a device that was trying to get it out. So I've seen things work. The, the problem is, is that right when we get down to the nitty gritty of, <laughs> you know, something happens, we know that the current scientists I'm working with, um, and I put up a little website for him just for free. Uh, let's see, let's see fluxpowertechnology.com. I think is, is a site. Uh, Doctor uh, James Schwartz. Anyway, he's able to pull energy using several harmonics out of and he's able to even produce like a one megawatt unit and he, he has a his working prototype you can see the youtube on that on that site he had you know cars blown up he was thrown in prison uh he sent me a copy of the national security order he had uh when a national security order is important to understand you see the the intelligence agencies being infiltrated have also ex exerted their control over the national uh the u.s patent office and they have a secret system in there called Sensitive Application Warning System, which means that anything that is uh, over unity, anti-gravity, that's why we <laughs> don't have – that's why NASA till wants us to believe we need rockets to uh, overcome gravity. Super room temperature, conductivity, you know, anything that basically can get us off of any of these dangerous obsolete technologies in nuclear oil and coal have thousands of these suppression orders that basically says your invention has been deemed to be a detriment to the national security of the United States. Therefore, you cannot share this with anyone. You know, it's a gag order. So thousands and thousands of these, um, probably close to 6,000 now, have been issued. Uh, Trump did mention some leasing some of these. That would be good. So this is how they keep a lid on it, and that's how they keep the whole planet technologically retarded. And hijacked using these obsolete technologies is through these uh, systems within the patent office or other methods of suppression as we talked about. Yeah, I want to talk a little bit more or at least tie up my point about the Tavistock Institute. They actually, and correct me if I'm wrong, they took what they learned from their social and psychological experiments and pretty much fed that into the intelligence communities, right? Right. And, you know, Alan Dulles, again, was the one who started MKUltra, which is the major mind control. And he also um, 
you know, it was evidence that he was working with Timothy Leary with the LSD thing back in the 60s. And he was also going around warning scientists that were back in the 50s when people were, scientists were trying to discredit George Adamski, you know, back in the 50s craze. He would go around telling him to back off. And, you know, according to the Reagan briefing with William Casey, the CIA director, that was basically one of those CIA ploys where they're trying to see what the people will buy, you know, how how easily are the public fooled? It makes me think of, you know, the uh, flat earth stuff that's coming out on YouTube, you know, it's like yeah. another CIA ploy to uh, see how how many people we can uh, we can fool. And they're constantly testing the water. You know, they have like these elaborate in their perception management teams at CENCON. They uh, send com rather it is is kind of a con actually <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah the, it, the, you know they have the software they can create multiple personalities they can it, hide their ip addresses in fact it was just disclosed that you know you know how the mainstream media keeps saying oh russia is behind this and russia is behind that and they have ways to totally make it look like the ip address and and everything is coming from another source and make it look like a false flag cyber attack you know like it's somebody else but it really isn't it's the intelligence agencies going in so yeah they're constantly um, manipulating and just kind of muddying the water so the average person out there who doesn't really have the time or luxury or even involvement to even wrap their head around this stuff because it's so bizarre when you get into it, it actually keeps its own best secrecy. So people, you know, kind of discount it. People really don't have the luxury to research this stuff. So there's so much conflicting information that people just throw their hands up and say, I don't know what to believe. It's all crazy, you know, and that effectively works for hiding the truth behind it. Yeah, it sure does. I feel that way on a daily basis. I, I don't have any idea what's actually going on. That's why I have to talk to people like you just to just to speculate, you know, and then the truth will resonate, I believe, with, with everybody in time. One more thing I wanted to touch on before we change. I believe in that, Ryan. I want to agree with you on that. Truth has this ability to resonate within people. Um, and what I, what I put as a solid foundation is these 500 witnesses that includes admirals, astronauts, generals, lots with supporting authenticated top secret and classified documents all coming together saying this. You try, if, if that was not real, that would be even stranger. <laughs> yeah. You know, so so there's certain things that you have to have as your rock solid foundation to go off of because the rabbit hole is wild and crazy and can throw you off into uh, going down the primrose path of disinformation. Then you find out that, you know, oh, it's all BS. And so it effectively sabotages people who are trying to find the truth. But there's certain rock solid things that are reference points that the documents and the witnesses are are revealing to to the public yeah and one more thing before we change course here i had not heard of this before i saw it on your website but could you explain to people what the silent sound spread spectrum is oh well i don't have any personal experience i just put it up there as one example of many you know, with the uh, new high-definition televisions and everything. In other words, the subconscious mind can, you know, it's well known. You know, hypnotists know this. They know that uh, Fifth Avenue advertising knows this. And they can put little, you know, sex and death and different things that the subconscious mind has a curiosity about. It grabs their attention. It's a whole psychological thing that the subconscious mind takes in everything without, any type of, of filter unless the conscious mind comes in and you know say oh wait a minute <laughs> you know uh and so things could be played backwards things can be uh hidden into images uh things can be sent at super high speed that the conscious mind can't decode but the subconscious mind can decode and that's what the uh spectrum is it's it's sending these, like you can hear like a little, eh like that and that could be like a whole bunch of information that just got fed into your subconscious mind you know i don't have a lot of experience or background and knowledge with that particular technique but i listed it because it's just one of many techniques and i'm sure they they use everything and they can in the book you know to affect the populations you know through uh, through television 
Well, you mentioned on your site this was a, a secret Pentagon psychotronic technology that's been operational since 1990, and it was used in the Gulf War in 91 to manipulate Iraqi troops into surrendering. That's pretty crazy. Yeah, well, think about it. If it goes into the subconscious mind, well, uh, one example, you know, when uh, regarding the subconscious and the effect it has is uh, Darren Brown, this is this hypnotist, a very famous one in the UK, who does amazing shows on YouTube. When Jack Kennedy was murdered by Sirhan Sirhan, uh, to this day, he doesn't know what happened. And there was a woman in a polka dot dress that went out on the, on the fire escape and it says, we killed him. We killed Kennedy. Well, curiously, he did a, he did an expose on that showing he took a normal guy who doesn't have violent tendencies, went hurt a fly, taught him how to use a gun, how to shoot, you know, and then he did this subconscious thing where he programmed him to be an assassination, be an assassin. And so he took him to this theater. And there was a famous personality up there, which they, they had the whole thing set up where it had like, you know, fake blood and things like that. And of course, the gun had blanks in it. This woman in a polka dot dress walks in front of him. Now, that's the trigger. You can have a program inside your subconscious mind, and then there will be a certain thing that activates that program. And when he saw the polka dot dress, the guy, just like a robot, stood up aimed the gun, fired several times, and sat back down and not knowing what, what he's doing. And the guy pretended like he, he got shot. This is something that, you know, the Manchurian candidate type of thing, where the subconscious mind can be. With Tavistock, what they were doing is they were creating so much trauma in an individual, and this was part of MK Ultra as well, that it would separate and split the personalities so that one personality could be programmed and be dormant while the other part of the program would, would normally function normally. But with a handler that has a certain keyword or, or, or whatever is the trigger, it would activate. Um, I understand the CIA uses some for of sex or something like that, you know, with things, but I don't. You know, I don't have a lot. I don't have any direct knowledge with this. This is the stuff I've been researching and studying from other sources. So I can't really speak uh, from firsthand experience with it. But there's no question that the subconscious mind can be effective. So is this something through HDTV that they can, if I'm sitting down watching TV and this SSSS, the silent sound spread spectrum is is active? They can essentially do the same thing as you described with the guy with the gun, right? They could plant something in my mind, and then later when it when I am triggered by that that same image or whatever, I will take an action based on that. Well, not not specifically that, but if you if you've noticed Hollywood, noticed how many crime dramas there are, and what's a crime drama useful for? It's useful for conveying images to the mind of people shoot everybody's got a gun everybody's shooting or killing or doing nefarious things to other people constantly the public is being shown images now there's this new movie called geostorm that's coming out think of all the apocalyptic movies that are coming out with you know uh san andreas or the tidal waves or you know you see all these apocalyptic things and you see all this violence on television there is the understanding kind of more in the esoteric circles that we as a collective consciousness can be affected and what the collective consciousness perceives and believes actually can kindle that into into manifestation this was uh we're getting into kind of uh on the on the edge of things uh more on the edge of that each one of us is like like a conscious fractal of a larger conscious mind that is co-creating reality and this ties into some of the work i did with dr marcel vogel noticing how our consciousness can affect matter you know, specifically, we're working with uh, substances of water and of, of quartz crystals that had specific geometries within them that appear to have an interface with, with consciousness. 
And we were able to measure this in a laboratory. We had a full-on laboratory with electron microscopes, spectrophotometers, everything, and measuring these things. I put my lab notes up at uh, marcelvogel.org. Anybody can check into that and some of the lab results. Yeah, uh, let, let me cut in here real quick. I <laughs> This is what I really want to talk about, the, the work you did with Marcel, because this is actually how I found you. I first came across oh, your really? work. Oh, really? Yeah, I first <laughs> came across your work while researching crystals and structured water. And so I found myself on marcelvogel.org, which you just mentioned. It's a site you maintain, and it's dedicated to the work of Marcel Vogel, who you worked with for many years on some research projects. And that research itself is why I actually reached out to you. And I didn't know about your involvement in disclosure or anything like that when I messaged you. That came later, you know. I was just interested, first of all, in the crystals and the structured water. So before we get into that, can we talk a little bit about who Marcel was and the night you met him and the event in your own life that led to that night that you met him? Sure. Um, Marcel Vogel was IBM's uh, top scientist. He was... uh... He had a laboratory at IBM in San Jose, and he's one. He had like a, over 140 patents. He he's the one that developed the red and blue phosphors for color television. He worked with liquid crystals. He uh, he was the one that developed magnetic coating on on computer hard drives. You know, like uh, is a major contributor to science and technology that we use every day. You know, how he got involved in it was. Uh, he had to give a course of creativity to the engineers at IBM. He had 35 engineers, and he was reading an article in Fate magazine about Cleve Baxter, who was a CIA uh, polygraph expert, talking about the communication with humans and plants, and that uh, how this plant that was hooked up to a script chart recorder, you know, with a squiggling needle. A person would come in and uh, trash the plants, right, and and go out and... Other people would come into the room and the, and the plants wouldn't react. The person that trashed the plants would come into the room and immediately the plants would react, you know. And he, he, he thought, well, this is curious, but he thought, oh, this is just garbage. And he wrinkled it up and threw it in the trash, <laughs> what he told me. That he thought, well, now this would be a good creativity course, you know, for the engineers. And so he actually decided to set up and reproduce the experiment with a flip splitly philodendron plant in his laboratory that he had hooked up to um, a script chart recorder with a na- needle wiggling along. He uh, took a match and burned one of the leaves, and he saw the, the plant would squiggle. And he said, this is what changed his life. He said, the moment the thought formed in his mind to do that again, you know, burn the plant leaf, it squiggled. And he said that squiggle changed his entire life, you know. He was a type of mind that, you know, I knew him before he set up the laboratory. I knew him when he uh, worked at IBM. He had a ferocious appetite to relentlessly find the answer to something, you know, whatever it was. He would work on it relentlessly, day and night, and sleep on it, and, and he was that type of mind. And so... He he tried it from seven miles away and was able to get the plant to squiggle, being able to attune to the plant. He started studying um, pramayama yoga, which is a science of breathing. He found that he could have a greater effect when he focused on the plant and pulsed his breath, kind of like the martial arts, you know, when they do, the, <laughs> you know, like that, you know. When you pulse the breath, you notice it was a greater, more pronounced effect. He did it from 14 miles away. He was able to, with his colleague in the laboratory, see the response of the plant. Then he did it on the other side of the planet in Prague, Czechoslovakia, and was able to set it up. And so what happened is um, he heard about, he went, he was doing a talk about the plants at a uh, science of mind church and this woman said oh you got to you got to try these crystals and then this, you know something like that and he thought oh brother you know more woo woo stuff right <laughs> yeah. and so he was found out he could pulse his breath and there was one of his co-workers who had a uh, a back problem and so he went to help and he found that he could relieve the uh, person with the crystal. It seemed to have an amplifying effect of his intention uh, with the breath. And so he slept on this and yeah, Marcel was trying to find out how to have more precise observable effects with the crystal that he had experience with healing a colleague there at work at IBM. And so he, uh, in the middle of a dream, he had a vision of a dipyramidal 
crystal. In other words, a pyramid formation on both sides of the crystal to create kind of like a laser-like effect. What a laser does is you have like two mirrors, right? You have one that's 100% reflective, one that's 99% reflective. And then you have, a, say, for a ruby laser crystal, you have like a ruby crystal in the middle and you excite it with photons. And the mirrors are spaced in such a way that it's a cascading effect where one reflects upon the other back and forth between the two mirrors and it builds up to this incredible energy that's so powerful that the one percent that comes out of the mirror is able to cut through steel so the power of coherence is extremely strong so he was able to do quite a bit with a number of medical doctors in the San Francisco Bay Area. Re- re- remarkable, incredible things. Anyway, all this developed out of his working with the plant and working with breath, and he worked with different techniques and measured uh, things in the laboratory. In the meantime, how I got involved in this was actually uh, an ET experience where there was it was a very positive experience of uh, I had a, like a Kundalini experience millions of volts going through my hands and my feet as being with a large head very loving eyes was projecting in space a sphere which was kind of teaching me a relationship between geometry and consciousness i had no background in this whatsoever when that happened i didn't know what an et or gray looks like or not to say there's many different races out there but what i observed was like the six-pointed configuration another geometry fit into that one another one into that one and it went into infinity and turned back into the perfect sphere the being i'm just trying to make this real short basically the saying that in actuality each of us is a totality of the perfect sphere which makes sense in the holographic universe of things and that we're aware of the subharmonic levels of those geometries but not of the higher levels and it's through love that we evolve from one level to the next and anyway, I'm, I'm kind of giving a kind of a download experience that uh, left me with this intense passion and desire. I had no idea. I didn't know what platonic solids were. I didn't, you know, know that a tetrahedron fits into the hexahedron. It's in the, you know, the isosahedron, the dodecahedron, that they all the points, they fit one into the other. I had no idea. And all this was being confirmed after I'm grabbing books everywhere I could. This is back in 1976. So there wasn't a whole lot of material back then trying to find everything i could on the subject matter but it seemed that this uh clear stone called quartz crystal over um incredibly separate in time and different cultures around the planet you know like uh, ancient india and american natives and you know cultures all over the world had similar attributes of uh, like crystal balls you know everything of this attributing to this uh, clear stone, right? So I heard about the work of uh, Dr. Vogel, and it was uh, in the middle of the storm with 100-mile-per-hour gusts going over the Golden Gate. I drove from San Diego up to San Jose, knocked on his door at night. He had me sit down. He was sitting, talking to this doctor on the couch, sat down the next to the doctor and turned off the lights for what seemed about a half an hour or so playing classical music. Then I... I said, yeah, I heard about your work, and I'm fascinated. I'm, I felt like what I had experienced gave me some kind of, there was like some kind of key to the, to the matrix of reality that we're in, having to do with consciousness and geometry. And so I heard about his work. The first thing out of his mouth was, you know, you're from another planet, aren't you? And I said, I don't know about that, but I'm fascinated about your work. And so he invited me to be a research associate. He was still working at IBM at the time, and the IBM was going to give him the electron microscope, which he built from scratch. And with my Navy background, working with the Naval Engineering Center, I was able to procure a number of you know equipment like spectrophotometer and that sort of thing for the new laboratory that he's when he retires out of IBM. So uh, a knock came on the door, and this woman with a daughter. She heard about the work that he was doing, you know, healing situations. So her daughter had this tumor that was protruding about three quarters of an inch off of her ankle. And Dr. Vogel worked on her in front of the doctor and I sitting on the couch. And using the technique of breath with the crystal, actually before our very eyes, physically dematerialized it. It disappeared. And it 
it's under the understanding that our bodies are actually a holographic form that appears physical that is actually being created by a higher oscillatory pattern that is being sort of, um, how do you say, um, transduced down into the physical vibration. So if you're able to, if you have a distorting pattern at the higher level and are able to pull that pattern out and, and replenish it with, he always worked with love. Love is like love for yourself, love for, you know, it's like the, it's like the integrative force of the universe. He used to say, when I love you, it empowers you to be whole. I forget the exact quote. But the, the main thing is, is that it left a really lasting impression that this man had able, was able to prove that he had a, this uh, understanding and working with the crystal in such a way that was able to restructure physical matter. So he um, you know, opened up a laboratory and I got him, you know, thousands of crystals. I went to the mines in Arkansas and, and cut them for you know, like two dozen medical doctors he was using. It's kind of interesting. One of the th projects we did was um, try to get some more money for the lab because not a lot of people put into was Psychic Research Incorporated there in San Jose. He had this uh, California winery that had this rot gut wine that he was able to take the vibrational essence of a fine finished wine, program it into the crystal, had seven right hand turns about about a five inch diameter of stainless steel going around the crystal in which he circulated thousands of gallons of this rot gut wine and was able to actually create a California award winning wine out of it. But you know, how are you gonna say, you know, this is crystal this has been crystal enhanced or something like that? What it is is that inside the molecular structure of the quartz was able to store and able to do this with Stanford Research Institute, or actually able to store a holographic pattern into a into a crystal and retrieve it in a very primitive type of way. But a uh, crystal stores information holographically into into several dimensions. The geometry within the, within it's a tetrahedrohexagonal geometry within the crystal that the crystal intermolecular bonding angle is at 52 degrees, which coincidentally happens to be the exact same angle of the Great Pyramid in Egypt. And those geometries link to golden mean or uh, 1.618 ratios, which go which you see throughout nature on our body it goes fractally into infinity. And so through the ability to transfer from the crystal into the wine, and the wine is made up of mostly water, just like our bodies are mostly water. We're on a water planet. Everything's made up, has water in it. And so there is a um, angular harmonic resonance that occurs within the crystal into H2O, water, which in electronics, if you had a... For example, you send a signal at 3 megahertz, for example. Now, being a broadcast engineer, I'm very familiar with this because I've had to cancel out uh, harmonics and things from our broadcast station that were appearing elsewhere that uh, were undesirable. We just wanted to broadcast on 105.3 FM on your dial. You know, So what happens is the 52-degree angle is resonated at... 22.5 degrees, which is the angular resonance in water, and 104, 104.5 uh, to be exact, very, very close to the twice of 52 and half of 52. These are the, um, if you were to have a, 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 a frequency, for example, at 3 hertz, you're going to have a frequency appearing at 6 hertz, because that's twice 3 hertz, and you're going to have half of three hertz which is at one and a half megahertz so what happens is there's a harmonic angular transference that happens from the crystal into the water which is the, the fundamental theory that we discovered in the laboratory that is occurring in transferring the energies he was uh he was thinking of all kinds of amazing ways to energetically transfer in the people's bodies you know healing essences through oscillating the resonance the, the very key important factor was these crystals where he was cut were resonant with the water molecule one of the projects that 
how to do with angular harmonic resonance, how to do with psychotronics and radionics, uh, something I've had some experience with that I've built a number of instruments and things in the past. I worked with two other scientists with Marcel on this that was developed back in the 1950s uh, by George Delawarre, and it was patented by the European Patent Office. You can go to marcelvogel.org and you can see photos of this thing that stood about five feet tall, and there's uh, patents on it as well. George Delawarre was able to create thousands, tens of thousands of these photographs using nothing but a drop of blood or a photograph or hair. In other words, in the universe, everything is fractally resonant. In other words, a drop of blood has the resonance of the person who you're attuning to. This thing stood uh, about five feet tall. It had cavities in it, which I was able to discover golden mean harmonics within the dimensions of the cavities. It had sound oscillators in it. It was beautifully machined out of brass, and it had these dials, which you had to turn particular angles. And on the top, there was a magnetic rotational. You had to line this whole thing up with the Earth's magnetic field. It had a cavity above, which would had a photographic plate, which had uh, lenses and reflectors in three different angles reflecting back down onto the photographic emulsion. In other words, the silver emulsion on the photographic plate was sensitive to these energies and was able to recreate these thousands of photographs. Having experience with different radionic, psychotronic, whatever title you want to give it, is something that was known back in ancient Egypt, basically as a tuning focus for the mind. He was able to go backwards and forwards into time with this device, which I've never seen on another device. An example, he took a blood spot of this woman who was pregnant, and she was like 50 miles away, and he was able to tune into the uh, fetus and move forward in time the different levels of gestation as the fetus was developing and evolving. And this was done at a distance of 50 miles away. In other words, it doesn't matter if she was on Mars or, you know, wherever. In other words, everything in the universe is, you know, the you talk about singularity theory and, and string theory and, you know, all these, that anywhere in the universe, you're resonant. And with this instrument, able to uh, attune to that and capture it on the photographic plate. So that was pretty uh, fascinating. And basically confirming that the reality that we are experiencing is holographic in nature. Yeah, and you mentioned something that I wanted to circle back to about the composition of the human body. Obviously, it's, I think, what, like 70% water. But is there any sort of crystalline structure in the body already? Yeah, the body is made up of tons of liquid crystals. You know, there's four states of water. There's uh, liquid, and then there's uh, ice, you know, solid, and there's gas, which is steam, and the fourth state is liquid crystal. Crystal state is where you actually have information stored, like, you know, in Dr. Emoto's work, which was after Marcel's work, you know, he was able to capture intentions and moods you know from from hate to love to you know by looking at as the water was going from a liquid to a solid it was able to capture the geometry of the of the programming of the geometry of that particular energy of love and gratitude versus you know i hate you you're 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 a scumbag or whatever you know the uh the difference in the energy we are constantly of course programming ourselves you know with our own consciousness i did work with uh, dr robert beck in the um in the 80s who was studying the effects in, of the brain on the liquid crystals within the brain which are these long chain cholesterol esters that are sensitive down to a hundredth of a nanotesla which means like you can be a, a block away and wiggle a magnet and the, the brain actually has the ability to sense that we become numb over our, you know, being barraged with all our electronics and things that we have today. But they found that the brain is basically oscillating with the Schumann resonance. Uh, Dr. Schumann, who we talked about earlier with the Viral Society, discovered the uh, physics, uh, discovered the Earth ionospheric cavity that's oscillating at about uh, 7.83 hertz that uh, is kind of in the alpha range, but found that, you know, back 
when the Soviets were using the uh, Woodpecker over the horizon radar, they were oscillating. They're on a 50 hertz grid. We're on a 60. They were hitting with a frequency where the heterodyne, in other words, the, the sum and the difference, was falling into a psychoactive window that causes the left and right brain to disassociate. And I actually did, when I was working at the Naval Electronic Engineering Center with this Navy captain, we were wrapping up some satellite equipment and something you can do in a sleep, you know, no problem. I was making these magnetic oscillators and experimenting with it, and I accidentally put it on the frequency that, I won't say what it is, causes the left and right to dis- disassociate. And I didn't know, it was a perfect double blind, you know, and he was trying to wrap this and he threw down his hand, what the hell's going on here, <laughs> you know, and I looked at the frequency counter and I said, uh-oh, I was doing a period measurement rather than a fer- frequency, and so I didn't realize it was that frequency that was a perfect double blind. But what Dr. Robert Beck did, he, he traveled around the planet meeting with different medicine men and religious leader, people who had special healing abilities and things that when they were in their working state of consciousness, it's like the left and right brain is like the man and woman within us and are like two separate beings, basically. And they have like two separate brainwave outputs. But when they attuned into the resonance of the earth, that particular frequency, the left and right brain the brainwave patterns synchronized perfectly with each other and it increased in amplitude. And that's when they were able to do their healing or their whatever they did. It's like the man and woman within was working in perfect harmony together. And that's when the magic happened. And the CIA, I understand, they have these little pins that if there's a hit, you know, from an ELF frequency like that, they, the brain has like a... Um, it has a, a psychoactive window. In other words, it, it ignores energies of a certain level below a certain threshold and above a certain threshold. But if it falls within the threshold at MIT, they're in a triple mu metal sh- shielded cage. They're able to create brainwave entrainment within four seconds of, with, a, with a double blind situation. So, And the papers that Dr. Breck gave me from the CIA that were very interested in this somebody broke into my house and they could have stolen a lot of things but that was the only thing that was stolen which was kind of curious oh wow yeah that is pretty curious you may have already mentioned this but could you tell me specifically how the quartz crystal interacts with the composition of the human body wow that's a deep one um (laughs) you got good you got good questions ryan well there's indicators. You know, when I study any of this stuff, you know, especially with the disclosure and the secret government operations and the extraterrestrials and, and the history and all this stuff, it's so highly compartmentalized, for example, in that one subject that anybody that says, oh, they have all the answers, you know, I wouldn't fully trust them. But there's a lot of indications of things that are higher probability than others right and so you know it's not like you come to an absolute conclusion but in your research there's indications and from at our current level of scientific understanding and the work i did with dr vogel this is this is based on what i've seen and what the lab work has, has shown that is that consciousness has somehow a geometric aspect to it and you know i just met uh, a few weeks ago with uh, nasim haramin who's who developed a theory of the structure of the reality uh with a 64 tetrahedral grid which is kind of based on the flower of life mm-hmm. in, but in 3d and uh, it's basically a tetrahedral arrangement in which all other geometry forms exist and we know that in the deep core sampling in Antarctica of water, what they discovered was water has the ability to form all the major seven classes of geometric uh, forms that we know in nature. In other words, water has a geometry within it that is universally resonant. And so both water and quartz share that, you know, as you see a snowflake, it has six sides, right? With a quartz crystal it grows, it has six sides. The structure within water is tetrahedral. The structure within quartz is tetrahedral. I'm just going to go over some ideas, and I think it might uh, help understand this 
further. When you squeeze a crystal, you know, crystals are used in, you know, computers, uh, radio stations, or frequency time standards for used for transducers, because when you squeeze a crystal, it generates an electrical current. Why does this happen? Because if you look at the shape of the crystal, it's like a six-pointed star, hexagonal. In the ancient days of Pythagoras, one of the mystery school adepts, he used to draw out what looked like a Star of David, but it wasn't a Star of David. It was way before that. It had a dot in the middle. He called it the Star of Creation. In other words, you have a male triangle and you have a female triangle interlaced between each other to form the six-pointed star with a dot in the center representing creation. With a quartz crystal, you have these charge triads, positive and negative, male, female, yin-yang, whatever you want to call them, interlaced between each other, and their charge centers of the positive and negative are perfectly balanced and neutralized in the center of the six-pointed star. When physical pressure is put on the crystal, it offsets these trillions of charge triads that are throughout the entire crystal lattice structure that creates an electrical charge. That's called the piezoelectric effect. There's more to this. You know, in in broadcasting, the military is finding that it can make antennas that are like fractal antennas that are universally resonant. And you can make them very, very small and they have, an, have quite an effect. Being a broadcast engineer, uh, I can say that when you make a phased array, for example, and Marcel used to say always that these sciences that we're studying in these you know, out-of-the-box sciences are akin to the known laws in physics. In other words, if you had an antenna radiator, it would have a set gain of like three decibels. If you had another antenna at it, it added to that and amplified it even more. If you add another one, it's called a phased array. A good example, if you've ever seen the picture of Harp up in Alaska? Oh, yeah. You see all these antennas at regular space intervals. There's many examples of phased arrays. What this does is you have a radiating element, and it's like every other element has an ability to re-amplify that energy. So... In a crystal lattice structure, you have microscopic crystal lattice structures going into, I don't know how far you could see a lattice structure. You know, crystals are, crystals are created, you know, in the earth where there's like uh, mineral deposits and magnetic fields and they grow in these solutions of silica and things. And there's a vortex of energy. That's why the vortexes go either left or right in spirals. That's why the crystals have a left or right hand of spiral in crystallography. And the energy that goes through a crystal is spiraling. It's important to note that it's kind of like uh, where these tantric or, you know, where you have a positive male, negative female, not to say, you know, <laughs> male and female are exactly opposite, you know, and, and, and equal. But when they come together, it creates this, um, this vortex that's moving through. And this vortex that's moving through the crystal that Marcel Vogel made and through natural crystals as well is part of the communication medium that is happening. It seems as though there is a dimensional transference of energy from one dimensional geometry to the next. And this was discovered, you know, back with the Russians in the the decahedral grid all over the earth and you know you have oh let's see what's his name uh with nasa who discovered the you know the face on mars anyway uh he discovered that on on the different planets and things that you have these points that are on the earth you have it on mars you have it in the sun you have it on jupiter the great spot you have these points at 19.5 degrees or 19.5 Four seven, to be exact, where there is this tetrahedron that is inside the sphere where this energy is, and there's like these different geometries, just like that ET experience I shared with, exactly the same way, where these energies converge, there is a, a vortex action occurring, and it seems as though the information exchange vortexes from one dimensional frequency to the X, and it seems there's a natural occurring of this within 
the quartz crystalline lattice structure that is coupling multiple dimensions. And that was part of the reason why it was important that the uh, quartz crystal was cut in such a way that it had a resonance that he would measure with a, a radionic instrument, a resonance with water, because if you could link into the water molecule, which is, you know, bodies are mostly made of, you could affect change through that resonance coupling. Right. So to answer your question, it's a science that is yet to be fully developed and understood. Marcel was a pioneer in being able to quantify it, you know, with the spectrophotometer. He was able to um, me- have measurable quantitative effects that were able to show that, you know, this indeed did occur, <laughs> you know. So, uh, I mean, there's a lot of woo-woo stuff about crystals and stuff like that, and I never really, I never really sort of resonate it with with all of that but i was more interested in the scientific aspect and you know how these discoveries could help expand our understanding of reality that we are in and how it could be used in ways that uh could benefit humanity that was my primary goal yeah there definitely is a a metaphysical aspect to crystals and this whole conversation really but I'm also interested in structured water. You know, we're, we're talking about crystals and water, but I'm wondering if all of these theories I've heard about, you know, pouring water over crystals to restructure it, is that accurate? And if so, how can I actually do that? Actually, I have quite a bit of, of awareness in the structuring of water. You know, one of the things that they do to structure water is they run it through a vortex. The, uh, the vortexing action actually creates structuring. When you have water that's in nature you have water going through waterfalls and you have little eddy currents that are spinning and things and it causes a natural structuring of the water in cities and things we have pipes and under pressure and going through right angle turns and stuff like that and all the smashing about of the crystal of the uh, liquid crystal i guess you'd say of the water loses its program so that by the time you and you have this amorphous uh, mess, you know, that you're putting into your body. Now, it's interesting with sacred springs. Dr. Vogel took a, um, a spring from, you heard of the water from Lourdes, France, and he took this other one from a sacred spring in Hungary where people have this miraculous healing, right, and attribute it to whatever. He took a, uh, a large container of bulk water, in other words, totally unstructured, unpatterned water, took this small vial of the structured water, which had an incredibly high energetic signature to it, put a little few drops of this water into this vat of bulk unstructured water, and the whole water replicated and took on this pattern of the uh, structured water, which indicates that the higher frequency vibration that is has, has structuring to it has ability to replicate and structure unpatterned water you know when you you think about the antarctic ice cores when you, they were able to discover all the geometries in water when you take water that has been structured to its original hexagonal geometry and the body takes it in it makes it so easy to assimilate for the different organs and things. Uh, you know, in reading some of the uh, pioneers in radionics and psychotronics, uh, Hieronymus, he was in France, in Paris, looking at a, a meat display of freshly killed animal organs and stuff, you know, liver, brain, hearts, you know, all the, you know, whatever. And had a glass case on it and he noticed that the frosting on the on the gas glass case different organs would form different geometrical patterns in the frost on the glass in other words your stomach vibrates at a particular frequency your heart your liver your toes your ear everything has a particular vibratory frequency to it and it can be it has emanations that could be picked up so when you take in water that is completely destructured what happens is the body can use it, but it has to work, has to pull from its own structuring, basically, to structure that water in order to use it. If it's in the universal hexagonal structured form that is universally resonant, as they discovered in the Antarctic course, then it immediately assimilates it and can utilize it effectively. So what we're saying here is then is that 
water is programmable, has memory of sorts, is that right? It has such intense memory. Water is replicating, uh, there's this great movie, I highly recommend it, called Water, the Great Secret, where they were talking, uh, you know, during the Vietnam War, these, these guys were figuring out ways of biological and talking about poison and stuff, and they had a had a pitcher of water where they were drinking water from. Uh, and they're talking about different ways of poisoning people and stuff like that. And they drank the water and they actually got poisoned, which is kind of fascinating. Water has this ability, whatever is in the environment, the water will replicate that instantly. I mean, it has, it's a dipole movement of the water molecule that it is so incredibly, it's like on this little teeter-totter that's so incredibly sensitive that any type of energy comes in, it's like like a domino effect, only instantly, like, you know, it replicates itself throughout the entire water structure. There's a professor up in Washington State, I'm trying to remember his name, too. Richard Hoagland was the NASA director, by the way, he just popped in. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, not not a NASA director, but a NASA scientist that uh, discovered the um, 19.5 degree angles, and which the Sidonian complex on Mars just right. happens to be at. Uh, what's his name? Uh, oh, well, no blank. Anyway, but what he's able to discover, he's actually able to make water purifying units that, when water is structured, it can't have any pollutants within it because the geometry kind of like close packs and squeezes everything out. And so... He was actually, on the basis of water structuring, he was able to make a, um, a device that actually could clean the water by taking the water that's close to the structuring element. Yeah, there's a water, uh, Dr. Carly Newday, who's a doctor friend of mine who's wrote the book uh, Water Codes, uh, which uh, you can get on Amazon uh, with Kindle or whatever. Incredible book, you know, talking about, she did a lot of research on water preachers where, you know, throughout history they're talking about and different religions and things, all attributing similar things about water. Water has this ability to completely replicate whatever the thought and belief and energy is around it. Yeah, and that leads me to believe that if I approach water as Marcel did the plants, you know, with, with conscious intention, with positive intention, could that help restructure it somewhat? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, without without question or doubt. When you drink water, bless your water, you know. Think that you know this water is going in and replenishing your body and, and giving your rejuvenating your body and giving you the life force, you know, that, that you need to operate. Uh, always use conscious thought and intention, you know, whenever you work with water. So what's the easiest way, I mean, besides the blessing and intention, what's the what's the easiest way to structure it? I've heard pouring over crystals, which we've been talking about. I've heard leaving it in sunlight for a certain amount of time. Does any of this actually work? Well, if the, depending what's in the program of the crystal, yes, it will structure the water, but you've got to be careful what's in the program of the, of the crystal. Here, uh, you know, we live off-grid in the mountains in southern Oregon, my wife and I, and we have a crystal that has the seven right-hand turns around it that we feed our, our tree orchard and garden with, and we put the intention in that crystal, we program it into it, and then that is then transferred into the water, which is transferred into the plants. Now, that's kind of elaborate for most people. There's different people, there are different products people are putting out, you know, merchandising, merchandising, uh, you know, with some of the stuff. Some of it works, some of it is kind of questionable. Uh, some people just, you know, trying to plagiarize and make money on it. You really have to, I'm, I'm evaluating one. I don't want to give any recommendations to anybody about anything until I, you know, do research on it myself. But yeah, there's ways to, ways to structure it through spinning, vortexing it. A friend of mine who I do technical trade with him for in exchange for his water, he uses uh, these silver rods and he uses like 32 oscillators that I help him set up with that use uh, a technique called harmonic cascade loading that basically with these harmonics and things help restructure the natural pattern that happens in nature through electronic means. So there's a lot of different ways to structure water. Uh, just, you know, 
blessing the water, knowing that your consciousness, being aware that you're a creative being and that you're affecting your reality and that the water is so highly sensitive that, uh, you know, like Bruce Lee says, you know, be like water, my friend, you know, <laughs> uh, you, we are water, we are constantly dynamically changing according to our conscious thought. And so we affect the waters around us. Let me ask a very basic question here then. I start to structure my water, I start drinking it. It's all the water I consume every day. How does it physiologically affect me? You know, does does it interact with the overall nutritional profile of the food that I eat? Do I need to have a certain diet to pair with this or a certain type of exercise? You know, like how do I optimize my physiology when I start to consume this sort of water? Well, for one thing, you can do like um <laughs> I don't know who you'd do this to, but, you know, uh, let's say if you were to do live on uh, fresh pressed organic juices, right? The organic juices have structuring in them. My mother had cancer. Uh, they wanted to remove her eye and half her face, said she was going to die. I took her to an alternative across the border because it's illegal in the California where they use nutritional therapy. And she lived to be 92. They couldn't find any tr- trace of cancer in her at all using the water i mean the, using the juices of uh like 13 glasses of fresh pressed carrot juice green drink and and, and helping eliminate you know water is wonderful for the body because it helps flush things out it's it's a, an incredible vehicle if you were to take that same carrot juice for example that has a structuring in it and you were to put it in a microwave oven microwave it nuke it for about a minute and then you know put it back in the refrigerator and you have these two juices one has structuring information in it which nature created and the vegetables or whatever that you juiced and then you have this other one that's basically had like a magnetic bulk eraser oscillating at a very high frequency that's how you erase a magnetic tape you run a magnetic eraser over it and it oscillates back and forth positive and negative so fast that it, it jiggles all of the all of the programming so that there is nothing left if one person was to drink the microwave juice and the other person was able to drink the non-microwave juice, you would see a dramatic difference over time where the structuring information that the life force that is contained in that structuring is not being assimilated by the one that's been deprogrammed, so to speak. Hmm. Okay. That goes well with what I wanted to wrap up on, you know, because I wanted to ask, you mentioned um, organic. Is there anything really organic anymore with all these chemicals in the air that are getting to the soil and things like that? Well, we live pretty self-sufficient off the grid, and um, <laughs> and we uh, are in the middle of uh, doing an aquaponic greenhouse so we can grow our own food because, if you know, there's so much contamination of food and, and fish, too. You know, along the whole West Coast, fisheries are dying off because of the Fukushima radiation. When you grow your own food, you have, like, kind of a connection with the food itself and the structure of live, organic, fresh pick, not, like, traveled, you know, across the the country and stuff like that in freezers and then, you know, using uh, pesticides and, you know, all the the different stuff that you do to mutilate food in order to make it look nice and pretty for the shoppers Mm -hmm. at the grocery. You really do a benefit for your health and saves money and you become more uh, more self-reliant and independent as well. So, you know, I highly recommend everyone growing a garden. My uh, my wife does this uh, on Facebook, uh, Live Green, Live Free. You can look it up. She has all these different recommendations that of ways people for empowering people to do things that help the earth and liberate you from um, life's expenses, you know, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah, life can be expensive too, you know, especially when you're trying to operate outside of this paradigm that just is not making much sense these days, right? Well, it's it's weaponized, it's toxic, you know, the uh, genetically modified stuff, the, um, you know, we got chemtrails, we got Fukushima, we've got the pesticide, and, uh, you know, Monsanto suing California for, you know, bringing it up to consumers' attention. You know, we have a compromised system that until we, it's like getting at the root of disease like Marcel did with the crystals, going into the core of the problem and pulling that out, and then the body can heal with love. That's what we're currently doing. There's a global awakening happening that these influences 
the unwarranted influences, as Eisenhower called them, have have infiltrated into our world and have uh, basically contaminated and hijacked it. So that it's only through awareness, you know, for shows like yours, Ryan, you're doing a public service by getting information out, you know, and not to trust any particular person, you know, keep open and look at it all and see what makes sense. So, uh, you know, the website that I put together, I'm still adding notes all the time at, you know, the dot net. It's just a free online sharing of my notes since I got involved in this subject that I keep going one oh my god moment after another realizing <laughs> my god you know this planet really did get hijacked and we could have a whole different world that's been hidden from us and the only way that is keeping it perpetuated is and that's why I took keen, keen interest in the mainstream media is the awareness of the of the public and it's because of the alternative media of the internet that there is this global awakening that's happening not only through alternative media channels like yours, but also through collective morphogenic field, you know, they call it the hundredth monkey or whatever, where we are all interconnected. We're like, you cannot change one part of the hologram in science without affecting every other part. And each one of us is a holographic representation of this collective mind. And each one of us, don't ever doubt your ability to transform the reality. In fact, I wrote a visualization called Imagine This, which is at you know the webmatrix.net, which kind of goes through children of the future, envisioning what a future in the world is like and 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 looking back through history at the elements that created the challenges for mankind and how once the internet came about they no longer had full control and through a global awakening because of this morphogenic field and you know what you said earlier ryan about truth having an ability to resonate well, this resonation of this truth is propagating throughout society. That's why you know people come up with ideas and inventions that they, it's been documented many, many times in the past from other sides of the planet that don't even know each other because we're all tied into this global collective mind that is becoming aware that we've been hoodwinked. And uh, unless we wake up, because what you don't know can hurt you, and the only way we can transform things is through awareness. Absolutely. And I have just one last question for you. And it's it's a question that I ask certain people that I've talked to that I think can give me not only a, a good answer, but a unique answer. But what is love, Dan? And what does it have to do with all this? Oh, let me uh, get the exact quote here, Marcel Vogel. And because I think he, he kind of summed it up well. He said, quote, Love is the glue of the universe and helps keep matter in form. When I love you, I empower you to bring yourself into a state of wholeness. And he said, our primary responsibility is to love. So love is, you know, in my interpretation is, although reality looks scary sometimes, <laughs> things, are, things look pretty separate, you know, Science on the leading edges are showing that we are all indeed interconnected. You know, like um, Chief What's His Name said, you know, what we do to the web, we do to ourselves. We're nothing but a string in the web, and what we do uh, affects every everything. And uh, love is like love is kind of the acknowledgement of the oneness of this integrative force that is throughout the universe that keeps matter in form and that it is the primary force that is you know recognizing oneness it's, it's hard to hard to put into words um it's such a profound question you know when you look at the emoto's work and you look at the high degree of structuring that occurs in the water that when loving thoughts are put versus non-loving thoughts it seems as though that's like a key indication that Love seems to be this universal matrix that I was attempting to try to understand with the work of Dr. Vogel and the ET experience is showing that there's a fundamental matrix and that matrix is interconnected and working in harmony with all things and all beings. And that matrix, you could call it love and everything that else is a distortion. Anything that is a distortion or an illusion 
of that reality that is other than that. Dan, I think that's a good note to wrap up on. I've loved doing the show with you. <laughs> <laughs> and I've loved I've loved having you here, man. I really appreciate your time, as I said up front. And we've mentioned your websites, thewebmatrix.net, marcelvogel.org. That's where people can keep up with you. Is there any place else that they can go to to get more of your work? Those are my two primary. I'm on Facebook, on facebook.com slash disclosure witness. Because since I had a ticket to talk about this, being one of the top secret witnesses that went to Washington. You know, each one of us has a um, an influence in this whole outcome of how this whole planet evolves. And uh, just know that you have a creative ability and don't underestimate your ability to transform the world and what you feel in your heart it should be. The hardest thing to do, Dan, is to get people to care about that and to get them out of their day-to-day, nine-to-five material lifestyle and get them to actually care about the power and control that they have as individuals. Yeah, it kind of is, uh, you know, there's, uh, as they say, you know, the service to self and service to others, you know, type of attitude where, you know, some people have compassion. They think about, you know, the people who are having a horrible experience, you know, have compassion for them, you know, but you bring out really great questions, Ryan, and it's questions that we all have to look at. It's like, you know, some people can never feel like, say, you know, if there's a baby crying on the bottom of the bridge and you're walking over this bridge and somebody abandoned it, what do you do? You keep walking or uh, or do you oh, try to find out and try to help help the little creature, you know, and uh, find its family or whatever. You know, some people have zero compassion. It's all about them and their reality and how many material things they can gather in the world before they die. And other people are, you know, they they want to uh, they want to see. They know the world can be can do a lot better than it's doing right now, and they want to see deceptions exposed and abuses uh, end it. And they know there's more to life than just the. The, the agreed upon reality that we're uh, we're being fed ever since we're we're little that there is that there is a world that could live in greater harmony working with everything it's not just a matter of uh, what the uh, shareholders are going to make if we make a certain decision that uh, oh it's going to fulfill the bottom line or is it going to impact humanity in a negative way you know it comes to um, the stuff you're made out of what uh, what choices you make. Absolutely. And Dan, again, thank you for your time. Thank you for your insights. Thank you for your service. I've enjoyed the conversation, and I hope to talk to you again real soon. Oh, thank you for your service too, Ryan. Holy shit. What to make of all of that? My thanks again to Dan Willis, first of all. Thewebmatrix.net and marcelvogel.org. Valuable, valuable resources there. Both are linked in the show notes. Definitely recommend checking those out. You know, it is so difficult to come to any sort of conclusion on the disclosure subject. I flip-flop myself on the extraterrestrial nature of things. I wanted aliens to be real for a long time, then went through a phase where I adamantly opposed the possibility of extraterrestrial life, and now I just don't fucking know. And to be honest, I don't even know if I care. And maybe that apathetic attitude toward it is exactly what the powers that be want from me, but there's just so much information to sort through when it comes to this subject. To call back to something Dan and I were discussing, there really isn't any sort of truth that's resonating with me here right now. But I am open to all possibilities, so open to them, in fact, that I'm putting together something on my own for you guys who are interested in this subject. A recent thread on Reddit caught my attention, and based on the nature of Dan's work and the disclosure conversation and another conversation that I have coming up in a few weeks, I thought I'd share the premise of this Reddit thread with you, but it requires some context and some explanation, so I'm going to record an addendum to this episode. It'll be in the feed in the next few weeks, and just for a bit of a teaser, the title of the thread from Reddit that spawned this idea that prompted this addendum is, quote, The Truth and Technology Embargo Regarding Extraterrestrial Intelligences and Human Interaction in Collaboration with Them is Coming to an End. To help you prepare, here's a bit of the hidden history, end quote. Now, I'm gonna be honest, It's a fucking crazy story, and I love it, and that's why I want to share it with you, and it pairs perfectly with this episode and another one coming up in a few weeks. 
I was originally shooting to have it released the same time as this episode, but it got way more intensive in terms of research than I thought it would, so please do give that a listen when it drops. Now, I know this subject doesn't have to do with straight-up occult study and philosophy, which seems to be what a lot of listeners want more of, and I hear you. I do want to focus more in that area, so expect that as we continue to roll on here. As I mentioned, I do have a few more episodes already recorded that are more in the vein of what you just heard in terms of general esoterica, and I actually have one episode specifically that's fairly practical that details a a missing piece, a hidden piece, an occulted piece of human health and wellness. But once we get through the next few episodes, more focus on occult study and philosophy, because what's a podcast called Occulture without the actual occult, am I right? But anyway, let's put a bow on this episode with Dan Willis. He was actually one of the first people I asked to be on the podcast before it even started, and it took us a while to connect, but I'm glad we did. Really impressed with his experience and depth of knowledge and his willingness to share so much of it here. A little bit of everything in this episode. Extraterrestrial disclosure, deep state infiltration and mass media manipulation, mind control, quartz crystal technology, the sacred geometry and memory of water, how to properly structure water, and love, love, love. And all of that, and the addendum I just mentioned, for free. But if you'd like to help support the show, head on over to oculturepodcast.com slash support because podcasting costs money and more importantly than that it takes a lot of time to put a podcast like this together and honestly i'd like to do more episodes like this longer episodes and more of them more often so if you feel like helping me offset some of the costs associated with this and you'd like longer more in-depth conversations please do consider supporting the show monthly this will help us increase our storage space so we can provide longer episodes and more of them more often We have seven levels of monthly support, the first of which is initiate at $1.11 a month, astrologer is $3.33 a month, magician $5.55, alchemist $7.77, adept $9.99, shaman at $11.11, and the ascended master level at $13.13 a month. If you don't want to support the show monthly, no sweat, you can make a one-time donation in an amount of your choosing. And actually, this is the first episode I've recorded since I created the support option, and we've already received our first donation. It was a one-timer, and thank you to Lynn for that. Much love and gratitude to you, Lynn. And I hope to recognize each and every one of you that chooses to support the show, no matter how you do it. I sure do appreciate the time that you guys spend with me, and I appreciate any sort of support that you offer me beyond that. And much love and gratitude to each and every one of you who are still here listening to me blabber on right now. But I gotta get out of here. It's way past my bedtime. You've been listening to O'Culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Oh.